welcome to Personal Landscapes. I'm your host, Brian Murdoch. You can find links for today's episode and other conversations on books about place at brianmurdoch.com. Today I'm speaking with Jerry Kobolenko. Jerry's one of Canada's most experienced Arctic travelers. He's skied, hiked, sledded, and kayaked more than 16,000 kilometers in Canada's far north. He's the editor of Explorer's Web, and he was awarded the Polar Medal in 2018 by Canada's Governor General, Julie Payette. He's the author of two wonderful books on the far north, The Horizontal Everest, which tells him of his, um, his travels around Ellesmere Island, uh, Devon Island, and Axel Heiberg, and uh, a photo and essay book called Arctic Eden, which is filled with incredible images of regions of the planet few people will ever see. We spoke about the lure of Ellesmere Island, about the perils of high Arctic travel, and his efforts to search for traces of historic travelers of previous expeditions in these places. He joined me today from his home in lovely Banff, Alberta. I hope you enjoy today's conversation. Jerry Kobolenko, welcome to Personal Landscapes. Thanks so much. Thanks very much for, for joining me today. So one of the um, purposes of this podcast was to highlight books that I think are, are uh, classics in the genre of, of writing about place. And I think uh, you've produced two that, uh, that really fit the bill. And I first discovered The Horizontal Everest, I think three or four years ago I read it. And it, it immediately took me back to an age when, when I'd first discovered maps as a kid and saw those mysterious islands in the far north of Canada. You know, it's such, a, such an interesting uh, splay of territory in a map, and the names are mysterious. And, and I think uh, you captured it really well when you wrote, Where is Ellesmere? Think of, the, think of the little metal disc that sits on top of a globe. Ellesmere is under that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's up there. It's way, way up there. And you said in the book that... That over roughly, this is this is going back a bit. I mean, it was published a little while yeah, ago, yeah. but over a fifteen-year period, you'd put in some thirty-five hundred human-powered miles. So this this surely puts you among the most experienced Arctic travelers of all time, wouldn't it? Well, it depends what you mean by experienced. Uh, um, certainly, hmm. uh, there has been a lot of travel since then, and uh, you know, fifteen years is now thirty years, and uh, I have continued to go to Ellesmere uh, um, until Arctic Eden. After Arctic Eden, I, I still go back once every couple of years, but, but uh, as a resource person for, uh, for uh, a cruise company, uh, Ellesmere just became too expensive. And uh, what used to cost $2,000 or $3,000, I was always an economic traveler, now costs twenty thousand dollars, and so uh, I returned to my, my first love, which was Labrador, and I've been traveling Labrador uh, pretty well exclusively since uh, about two thousand and two thousand and six. So how do you, how do you cope with those costs? I mean, even even when I was first starting out, uh, the far north just it wasn't even an option for me. It was so difficult to get there; it was so expensive. Like I found it easier to go to Mongolia than than my own country in the north. Well, yeah, if you do it um, without subterfuge or, or without um, uh, technique, like if, if you just buy a ticket on an airline, it's $7,500 just to get to Resolute and, uh, from, from Ottawa, and you can fly to Australia and back three times for that cost. But there are, you know, there are ways around that, and using frequent flyer points, for example, uh, Although this era is gone now, a lot of the old timers used to hitchhike on half-empty charter aircraft. So you would hang around uh, a town until somebody was flying north and didn't had a little bit of extra space and didn't mind somebody uh, hitching a ride, and uh, you would you would jump aboard. And so I have. Uh, done Ellesmere expeditions from southern Canada on as little as two hundred dollars return. That's incredible. Oh yeah, and and that is the only way. If you know, if you do, there, there are people that spend years fundraising for one trip, and I, you know, I do these trips, you know, once a year, twice a year, three times a year. And if you do it that way, the only way to do it is by uh, using technique to minimize cost. And 
I've always been good at um, finding ways to get north cheaply because I don't have deep pockets. And to travel uh, 20 times to Ellesmere Island, which is the most expensive place in Canada, is a uh, you know is is a feat as difficult as pulling a sled for 700 kilometers on the island. In terms of travel, it, it, having time helps. You know, you you can travel much more cheaply if you have infinite time to to wait for those opportunities. But what what changed what changed then between between then and now to make it to make it so expensive? Well, the cost of gas went up. I, I remember exactly when when things changed. I, I did a. Um, the Discovery Channel, Canadian Geographic, did a film based on the horizontal Everest. And we flew up in 2002. And uh, First Air was getting out of the charter aircraft business, and that left only one airline in town. And the, media, the, the minute they had a monopoly, the price went up. And combined with the price of gasoline, it went up a lot. And um, that meant that nobody flew on on partially empty aircraft anymore so hitchhiking was over it was more or less over uh you know even when i started i just pushed to extend the season but the classic some of the classic guys uh bill mason the canoeist and filmmaker or fred Brummer, an, an early arctic photographer they uh, they didn't pay to fly they just hitchhiked mm-hmm. so, well, i just read something about that what was um james houston uh, yeah, his his uh, con- uh, confessions of an igloo dweller. He talked about that hitching hitching his way up uh, James Bay. That seemed like a vanished age, you know, kind of a glory day glory days of travel. Everyone did it, and and uh, you know it was it was out on you know even when I was first starting. But uh, as you mentioned, if you have time, you can you can wait. And I would go north to Ellesmere or to uh, to Resolute, which is kind of the gateway to Ellesmere with with three or four sets of maps and i would do the trip that materialized where i could basically get to it oh that's a really good idea yeah yeah so so what is the lure of ellesmere for you well it is it's an alien environment uh when i first first saw it i already had some experience with the north through labrador um and then i i went um on a on a kayak tour to Ellesmere just as, uh, as a journalist. And it, it blew me away. It, the, the 24 hours of daylight where there's uh, it, for much of the summer, there's one F stop difference between noon and midnight. So it's not this kind of twilighty um, middle of the night light that people sometimes see in photographs. It's broad daylight. The wildlife, um, were tolerant of people because they'd seen so few over the years. It was an open landscape. And even though I grew up in Montreal, uh, I had a kind of natural love of open country where trees weren't in the way either of walking or of seeing. And so something about it um, unconsciously hit all the buttons. And, you know, some of us, have a vulnerability to um different places and uh, i i was one of them it was just it was love at first sight basically and immediately after that tour i began planning the next one and the next one and the next one and i just kept you know going north and it's still um it's still really a, a, you know a, a first love in reading your descriptions too, it really reminded me of, of my first glimpses of a desert place. Like the desert places have, have always held that allure for me. Those those vast empty landscapes, you know, and you see like the, the bones of the earth stripped bare and geology exposed and, and that feeling of being dwarfed by a place, you know, you're so small and insignificant out there. And Yeah. In fact, it, it is partly a love of the desert. The only thing is that I'm better in the cold than the heat. I suffer a lot in the heat. I've never met anyone who is good in both cold and heat, and I'm pretty good in the cold. So uh, I gravitated to a cold desert. I don't know. I don't know which I would be. Like the the Sahara heat's pretty miserable in the daytime. You, you can't do anything. But then in the, those evening hours, you know, you've, I've read some someone had written in the evening you forgive the desert for everything it has done to you because the daylight or the evening hours are you know are nice, but 
in in the Arctic, every hour is nice. I, I don't. Uh, I can't work in hot places. I found like trying to write or think in a hot place. I'm just. I find hopeless. But uh, I prefer cold places for that. But I've, I've never had a, an opportunity to you know travel the high Arctic. Well, also if you're a walker, um, you know the high Arctic uh, appeals to you because it's not people think of the arctic as you know these muskegs and swamps and um you know full of mosquitoes and black flies and the high arctic is not like that at all it's a it's a polar desert it's very dry the walking is great you can walk anywhere the mountains you can find a route just to, just to up just about any mountain I, i'm sitting here in the canadian rockies and you know a lot of the peaks have um, you know, one side that you can get up and then the, the rest of the sides and you're confronted with cliffs. You don't get that in, in, uh, in the high Arctic, you can walk up just about anything. And so if, if you are, uh, um, someone who loves walking and movement, uh, the high Arctic is ideal. And that's another reason why I prefer the cold deserts to the hot deserts, because as you mentioned, it, it's hard to do things in, in uh, hot deserts during the day and uh you know even at night you're lo- you're losing your light it, it's you've got a, an hour or two uh of um of relatively cool twilight but you, you you don't have 12 hours of it or 16 hours of it or 24 hours of it well that, that was uh those are two things that really struck me from from reading this as well the uh the ease of walking over this terrain how the the feeling of absolute freedom that you can just you know, look, look to the horizon, plot a course anywhere and, and just walk wherever you please. That really appeals to me. Well, yes, yeah, so there is a sense of freedom and it's not only the freedom of walking on firm tundra in the summer, but something that people in the South don't understand is that a combination of cold and wind turns snow, which, you know, we're, you know, People in, in you know, many parts of the world are familiar with snow, but they're fam- familiar with snow being soft. Um, the Arctic snow is extremely hard and you, you can walk on it without skis or snowshoes and don't sink in and you can pull heavy sleds over it. So even in the colder seasons, uh, the walking is terrific. You're walking on the frozen ocean. You're walking on sea ice with a little bit of rock hard snow on top of it. And that also is a walker's paradise. One of the myths you uh, you blew away for people, I think in this book too, but also in, in Arctic Eden, was that the Inuit don't have 33 words for snow or whatever the, the saying mm-hmm. is. But you listed quite, uh, quite a glossary of snow terms that you had come up with as well. Oh, yeah. Well, if, if you're a walker, the, the, uh, the snow makes a, a huge uh, difference. Subtle differences in snow determine whether you can pull a hundred and... 50 kilo load or only 115 kilo load the the coefficient of friction in, increases almost linearly so you you would think that minus 35 is about the same as minus 40 it's not minus 40 is a lot harder and minus 45 is harder than that and minus 50 is harder than that and minus 20 or minus 17 is about the best conditions you can be pulling over because you have that glide and yet it, it's not so mild that you're um, you're getting hot. So it, it stimulates you to move faster and uh, um, and move longer. So I find minus seventeen ideal travel conditions. Snow the snow gets gets hard because of the the combination of wind and cold. So you need you know after a fresh uh, snowfall and you don't get a lot of snow in the high Arctic, but after a fresh snowfall you need a couple of days of of blowing wind to firm it up and you know in uh, you know, as it firms up, it's better in some places and worse than others as as the drifting snow accumulates. And you know, the uphill side of these small ridges, snow ridges called sastruga, the uphill side harden much um, sooner than the downhill side does. So sometimes you have to uh, just put on skis until you get over that uh, transition period between the initial the initial dump of snow and the the transformation into something solid and easy to walk on i don't want to give the impression that you're you're all about uh, long slogs because that's that's one of the things i really liked about your books that they aren't that sort of adventure slog you know the the 
to trudge to the pole sort of thing. They're driven by curiosity and, uh, you know, tracing the route of some previous traveler, for example, or investigating some interesting feature on a map, that, that really appeals to me as well. Well, they began as, as slogs. You, you know, when, you're, when you start out, you're young and you, you know, just have a lot of beans, you, uh, you know, the, the, the slog appeals to some of us. But after you've done 10 of them, it gets old because you're, you know, you're basically doing the same trip over again um many times and so it, if you want to continue to develop as a traveler you change and uh, at some point on Ellesmere I changed to be uh, m- more interested in the history and um you know uh before that I became interested in photography and so I I developed as a traveler and that's how I've continued to go to these places and yet have them still feel fresh because because i am changing all the time in my approach to these places i suppose it's part of testing yourself too like when you're when you're young you you have to you want to test your limits or with just with just normal types of travel i mean the my first trips i, I went to north korea and the darien gap and you want to go to the most kind of hardcore places you can think of for for to, to plunge into those things but then yeah it's, it's it's been that way for me as well much more curiosity driven chasing down some sort of a story or some bit of curiosity. I think you, you really captured it here where you wrote it's historic tragedies had a reality that current events did not here. The ice age still lived shaggy relics called musk ox and pod for dark lichen. And the last camps of explorers stood as if freshly abandoned. That's a, that presents a, a really interesting glimpse of a place that people would imagine just to be lifeless. It, it's not, it's not lifeless at all. You, you sometimes have to, look for life and you know truth to tell when snow covers the ground what you see are the big animals the muskox the caribou the foxes uh, but there's a lot of subtleties in the summertime when you're looking at at that uh, the tundra plants that have worked so hard to to gain a foothold but but just to uh, hark back to what you were saying earlier i mean, I mean a lot of my trips or my trips have been driven by intellectual curiosity, but there's always been a physical component in large part because I'm a restless guy and I need, I need to burn up, burn off this restlessness to be able to better enjoy the, uh, the place where I am. And if you uh, are inclined to do this sort of thing, it's not a slog in a negative sense. It's a slog in the positive sense where these the uh, sloggy elements are just the price of admission and uh, it's the price of admission to a place that you cannot gain access to in any other way other than a little bit of discomfort a little bit of effort fatigue there are those of us who would do one trip like that and never do it again and there are those of us that just kind of shrug off oh okay it's cold it's hard it you know it's uh, um but it, it is the only way I'll get to this place, and that's fair game. There's something about the struggle that it takes to get to a place that's hard to reach that, that makes it all the more satisfying. But even traveling through the place once you're there, you, that is, that's you know, the, the effort, the, the traveling at 40 below or, or dealing with wind or you know, dealing with um, some occasional diff- difficult terrain – that that's just a, a shrug off. That's just oh, okay. Well, you know, that's what you have to. That's what you have to do to enjoy what is in many ways a paradise. One of the things I liked about the book as well is is the the stories you told about these previous expeditions and whose whose remains you then went on to try to locate. What were some of the most moving or the you know the most memorable locations that you found linked to the past? Well, what what really awakened me to to um, historic travel is the the Greeley expedition of eighteen eighty one to eighty four. Um, Adolphus Greeley um, was a um, an American um, army lieutenant who led a um, twenty five men to northern Ellesmere Island during the first international polar year, and they for the first couple of years they. You know, they did their job. They had they had issues. They had they had conflicts, but uh, things went uh, as planned. But they did not have a ship with them. They were dropped off by ship, and the problem was that 
relief ships were not able to reach them. So they made this uh, desperate flight south and uh, ended up stranded on this barren island off uh, the uh, coast of central El- central eastern Ellesmere. And for the next eight months, they try to stretch out 40 days of food and all but six eventually perished, mostly of starvation. Well, that was Pym, Pym Island? Yeah, that was Pym Island. Yeah. I saw photos of that place. God, it's, it's a bleak spot. Yeah, well, I, again, it's exposed to the, the the storms that come up the North Water. If you go in just 30 kilometers, it's gentle, and there's muskox, and they just never thought to look in there. So they were stranded on the, on kind of the, the outer edges. It's just like if you're, if you're on the coast of Labrador. The outer islands are all barren. There's no trees on those outer islands, but you just kind of tuck into a little bay, and then suddenly you're getting trees. Why did they never go inland? They never thought to. You know, they reached it just as the sun was. They reached Pym Island just as the sun was disappearing, and so they built a shelter and just hunkered down. Um, they try to hunt around their little area, but it's such an asteroid where they were that no self-respecting animal is going to walk by, except maybe the occasional polar bear or fox. Whereas inland, they would have inland was so fecund that. The uh, a Norwegian explorer Otto Sverdrup, who who came about uh, twenty years later, uh, set up a muskox hunting camp maybe thirty kilometers from where the Greeley expedition starved to death. God. So so what was left? What was left of the place when when you found it? A lot, a lot. Uh, the the walls of their shelter. They had a they had draped a boat uh, over their shelter, which they eventually. When when uh, um, winter turned to um, to late spring and and early summer, they eventually burned it for firewood. So the the boat wasn't there, but um, there's uh, the little matchsticks that they used to light their stove were still there. Uh, the bullets, some some bullets uh, were lying around, little shreds of clothing, uh, just. It's it's a treasure house, and you just kind of wander around on your hands and knees and look for stuff. And when you find a button or a shred of shirt, you try to imagine if if you know you try to imagine who it belonged to and under what circumstances was this bullet the one that uh, you know that that so and so fired at a uh, at a ptarmigan and missed, or was this one of the bullets that uh, executed Private Henry for stealing food? It, it's it's a a detective story and it um, it prompts you to not just go there and, and look around but to do your homework before going because the place then becomes so much richer and uh, so much more exciting because you know what you're seeing i found uh, i found a button like that once in in chad we're in the middle of chad in the we just came up from the uri plain in the tebesti mountains so in the central sahara and found this uh, this old french fort on a hillside we were looking through the, the remains of this fort and so, somehow under a stone or something, I found a button off a uniform and I, I, I could trace the uniform uh, by, you know, comparing photos. I contacted some experts on uniforms, but never found out um, who, who was there or why. Well, how old was the uniform? The button would have been early 1900s. Oh, well, yeah, that's great. But I never, never got any farther with the story. I've, I've been looking ever since. So yeah, I know that I know the sense of excitement and, the, from from the stories that you've told, uh, it just seems like there's so much stuff there. I suppose it lasts as well as it does in the desert in these places. Well, that that's it. It's it's like the you know the Anasazi ruins of the U.S. Southwest. Uh, if a place is is dry, and if a place is dry and cold, it's essentially in a freezer for ten months a year, and so things take um, can take centuries to. Uh, you know, eventually deteriorates. So a, a lot of the most interesting and earliest expeditions to uh, to the high Arctic were in the late 19th century. And that's well within survival rate for that for that region. So sometimes sometimes you'll find a camp that looks like it was uh, you know freshly abandoned wow. stuff the, the the rings, the stone uh, 
the stone rings of their tents are there. The the uh, um, the stoves are there. You know, bits of bits of wire and broken crockery are there. And again, that stimulates you to, you know, if you're doing a route, make sure you know what's there because then if you find something, it becomes so much richer. Because on those early trips, I wasn't interested in that stuff. I so I was blazing past. Uh, sites that uh, nowadays I'd be, you know, I just want to kind of poke around and, you know, spend spend hours or two just looking and trying to piece together those old stories and also um, interpret some of the um, some of the problems that the explorers had because if you're an experienced traveler and if you have kind of done your homework on um, on these historic expeditions, uh, a traveler can add um, some modest interpretation, some modest historic interpretation, because academics have read the journals, they've they've spent their time in the archives, but they don't really have a sense of place and they don't really know how hard uh, a particular route really was. And if you do, uh, it does uh, allow you to add a little something to the record. Well, that was one of the interesting stories too, that you told about some um, tracking. I think, was it a German expedition around um, Axel Heiberg Island? And yep. you were, you knew where the Cairns were up to a certain point, And then the trail just kind of goes cold and tried to trying to piece together. Where would these guys have gone? You know, if I was in that position, knowing the land, where would I go? That was really interesting. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a tremendous amount of fun. And that that's, it, you know, I've, I've done several types of trips. They all did have a physical component, but th- there are the, you can say that there are the hard trips. There are the, the trips where I was focused on photography. And, and then there are tr- the trips where it was looking around sites and tr- trying to understand historic mysteries. So for the, for the Greeley expedition, you said they burned their boat. Why, why would they not have tried to make it to Greenland? Uh, because the uh, th- there was too much ice in the channel that particular year. That that um, that area most of the time it freezes into what's called the ice bridge. So so uh, for a thousand years, Greenland and Inuit would come across to the Ellesmere Island side to hunt, and then um, go back to Greenland where the conditions were a little warmer because of an offshoot of the Gulf Stream. The, the Greeley guys did not realize that had they gone 30 kilometers further north, they could have walked over to Greenland. They, they didn't think of that. And yet there was too much ice. They, they tried to get across by, by, you know, by boat and by, by walking. And they, they were just taking a, a linear line from Pym Island. They didn't know that uh, you have to swing north a little bit to get across. Was that just because nobody had traveled in that region? so extensively to know these things well the inuit the inuit knew it well but they you know they they weren't particularly good travelers and so they didn't think to go inland to look for game and they didn't think to you know try to the south and try to the north and uh, you know tr- try any which way and truth to tell by the time the light returned in the springtime they were all starving so they didn't have a lot of of juice in the legs to you know be um, tentatively exploring 30 or 40 or 50 kilometers in all sorts of directions to see, to see what would turn up. So how many survived? Greeley survived, right? Yeah. Greeley and five others. And he went on to be, become what the head of the explorers club. No, no, he, but he was one of the main figures in the explorers Hmm. club. He became a, uh, he became a general. He was involved in, uh, in the relief efforts of the San Francisco earthquake. And so did one of his uh, um, his companions, uh, David Brainerd, also became a uh, a general and uh, and quite quite successful in in the army. Yeah, Greeley, and and it was interesting because Greeley was always like a rail of a man who you would think would be would have been one of the first to die, but somehow he must have had a very slow metabolism and just managed to survive maybe was motivated by the desire to set an example for his men or or whatever but uh, he he did not have the physique you would think would survive eight months of starvation did he ever go back to the arctic no no but he was uh, the way it worked in those days was even if you led a disastrous expedition there were so few people that 
that had traveled the Arctic, you suddenly became, you know, the most famous polar explorer of your day. Hmm. So he, you know, he led an expedition where 19 of his men died. And yet he was, he was the, you know, if CNN wanted a, wanted a soundbite for, for about the Arctic from someone, they would have gone to Greeley back in the, uh, uh, back in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Wow, that's funny. It's the guy who, who didn't think to look over the hill for the muskox, you know? Yeah, yep, exactly. So so why did so many of these early expeditions come to grief? They were, well, certainly the British, they were sailors, and there's a difference between being a sailor and being a, a, a you know, a land traveler. Um, and, uh, of course, the British had the, the cultural superiority that, that – uh, um, meant they didn't want to learn from the Inuit. The the British, who were good Arctic travelers, tended to be the expatriates who uh, were more open to learning from other cultures. And you know, in the case of the Americans, some some of them were were good travelers who uh, adopted Inuit ways, and others were not. And uh, the, the the problem is that some of these expeditions were brought far too many people to survive on the land. 25 people um, on the Greeley expedition. Well, the Arctic can support, you know, two or three or five, uh, you know, that the Inuit would live in small family groups and survive very well. But but for the Arctic to support 25 people or, you know, 129 people as on the Franklin expeditions, there are very few parts of the North that are that rich. And you need it to be, you know, next to... uh, uh, you know, a, a walrus colony or something like that to support that many men. So, you know, and you're also dependent on the ocean. The mm. high Arctic is, um, does not have enough muskox and caribou to support even a, even a few people. So you have to hunt seal and, and whales. The, that is how the Inuit survive. The ones who try to make a go of it inland tended to die out. It's interesting too that the Greeley uh, team survived on on some sort of a shrimp like creature. Yeah, yeah, they and they they hated it and they thought it was useless and it was just providing psychological comfort. But in fact, it it had uh, these little crustaceans, mini crustaceans, had were so rich in lipids that they were actually getting significant calories for quite some time. So every little thing that they did worked for, worked for them and they, they were aware that it worked and other cases as with the, uh, with the, sh- the shrimp, they didn't think it did much good, but it, it, it definitely saved their lives. You said something similar about scurvy. I can't remember if it was the Greeley expedition or, or a different one. Where when you went to the site and looked around, there were plants right there that were an amazing source of vitamin C, and nobody nobody thought to try eating them. Yeah, Oxyria dignia, um, um, Arctic sorrel. Yeah, and, uh, here in the mountains, when you go on a day hike, you often run into mountain sorrel, and you taste the, the, the broad little leaves, and it really gives you kind of a tart hit that tells you, hey, you know, that's you know, it's it's like uh, drinking orange juice. Uh, and they never they never thought of it. You know, the fact that scurvy was caused by an absence of something w- was an intellectual leap for a lot of those people. And and in fact, the a true understanding of of uh, what scurvy was, uh, I think I think didn't happen until the 1920s, like really quite late. It was thought to have been, you know, a kind of poison or, you know, some food gone bad and added something. They can, people had had always understood poison, but to understand a lack of a chemical in you, that that was um, uh, a bridge too far for the uh, uh, the intellect of the time. I didn't realize how fragile it is as well. It, it, even when they discovered dosing with lime or 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 uh, lemons. But that mixing it with something might kill it off, or or but sending it through copper pipes. Copper deactivates vitamin C. Those big, um, you know, those big molecules break down very easily, and vitamin C is one of the things that uh, uh, you know the Inuit would get it from meat. You know, the, the Inuit weren't eating sorrel; they were eating raw seal meat. 
and there's plenty of vitamin C in in raw meat or in the skin of whales. The skin of whales, the so-called muktuk, is absolutely you know rich in vitamin C. That's how they got it. They weren't eating sorrel. I mean, you get an awfully strong jaw from eating that as well. It's like chewing a rubber band. Yeah, I know. I I've always <laughs> compared it to a combination of uh, candle wax and an oily rubber boot. It's it's yeah. uh, it's an acquired taste for sure. Yeah, I had that in Iceland. I was in, uh, I did a magazine story, and I, and I met some friends of Larry Millman, and she uh, she served us up some some fish soup, and she had put some muktuk in it, and the Icelander, the the fisherman that was with us, just threw down his fork in disgust and said, "I'm not eating that. It's like uh-huh. eating a rubber boot or something." Yeah, yeah, you do, you just keep chewing it, and it's like hard chewing gum, and then eventually you lose patience, and you just kind of swallow it in a gulp and hope it doesn't go down your windpipe. So, so speaking of Inuit travelers, then, yeah, a, a man you mentioned in in the book, I don't know if I'm pronounce it right, but Nuka, Nuka Pingwak. That's right. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. You said he was the greatest traveler in the high the high Arctic has ever known. Yeah. So, t- tell us about him. What's what made him such a, an amazing figure? Well, he was one of the, one of the uh, Greenlanders on in the uh, Northwest Greenland. There was a small population of Greenlanders cut off from the rest of Greenland, maybe 200 of them. And all the high Arctic explorers would would kind of hire them, uh, would hire the women for sewing duties, for sewing parkas and, and uh, kamiks and, and the stuff like that. And they'd hire the men as, as hunters. And uh, Nuka Pingua was from, I think, 1913 till the late 1930s. He guided just about every white expedition that uh, that went up there. No one ever went hungry. And, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of those hunters did not have the longevity that Nuka Pingua had. He was doing it for, uh, you know, over over 20 years. And uh, he was. He took part in some of the, you know, the, the greatest ball expeditions, including some of those RCMP patrols of the 1920s and 30s that covered thousands of kilometers in a season, um, really just to lay down the, you know, the flag of Canadian sovereignty, which the Canadian government was concerned about at the time. But these were just wondrous journeys in their own right and uh, so he accompanied these expeditions uh, you know as a as a hunter but he also left a legend of his uh, of his own and uh, you know, partly because of his competence because of his longevity I, i've always really loved uh, loved the story of nuka Pingua. so would he would he be the early arctic traveler you admire the most yes definitely most of your travels, um, you said, were concentrated around uh, Ellesmere, Axel Heiberg, and Devon Island, right? Yeah, yeah. And how how would you characterize those islands? Like, how how would they differ in terms of the feel of the place, the landscape? Axel Heiberg is in the same uh, relation to Ellesmere that Ireland is to England. So it's it's really just you know ten kilometers across uh, narrow Eureka Sound. So it, so it's uh, it's a it's a little smaller. It's about two thirds the size of Ireland. It, it feels the same in the winter and the spring season. In other words, when there's snow on the ground. In the summer, it's a little bit different than Ellesmere. Ellesmere is big enough that you can wander inland for you know long periods. Uh, Ellesmere is covered by, about one third of Ellesmere is covered by ice cap. And much more of Axel Heiberg is. So the ice cap and the glacier uh, glacial flow that comes from that ice cap um, is much more disruptive to summer hiking, so it's much harder to hike Axel Heiberg in the uh, um, in the summer than than it is Ellesmere, for example. Uh, Devon is a little bit different. Uh, the west side of Devon tends to be kind of flatter, um, less interesting from my perspective. Again, the eastern part is is largely covered by ice cap. A uh, little bit less mountainous than Ellesmere and Axel Heiberg. Uh, Devon is, is still still has that I- incredibly wild feel and good travel conditions. I, I like it a little bit less than Ellesmere and Axel Heiberg, just because the topography is less uh, spiky and sawtoothed, and maybe the travels a 
a little bit more difficult. You, it, so the south coast is difficult travel because in the in the springtime the ice can break off. There's some strong currents there, so you have to kind of watch yourself if you're pulling a sled on sea ice and you're being interrupted by um, uh, by headlands a lot if you're trying to hike and you're going to be running into ice cap a lot on the south coast. The north coast has certain areas, but again, you're uh, unless you're in the east where it tends to be, or in the west rather, where it tends to be a lot flatter, the, the hiking is not quite as good as it is on Ellesmere and, uh, and Axel Heiberg Island. So, you know, uh, judging it just as a, as a traveler and as someone who travels those places, uh, I drank... Uh, Ellesmere and Axel Heiberg are... are uh, you know slightly different but kind of in the in the same ballpark devon is a little bit different but uh, still a, a a lovely place to go has how ex- extensively has axel Heiberg been traveled in the interior well you know i've crossed the island a couple of times but you know there have been glaciologists at a uh, at a science camp on the on the west side of the island that come for a month or so every uh, every springtime and have been doing so since the 1960s the interior is all ice cap and so um you know you'll you'll have had i think there was one party that that did not quite an entire north to south uh trip on axel Heiberg, but you know again that that is ice cap skiing there were, I, I think, some military groups that did that in the 1970s as well, but very, very few people have um, skied the interior. The, the coast is uh, is more interesting, but again, it, it's uh, not easy to get to. It's, it's remote. It's hard to get around unless you're extremely active. For the past 10 years or something, um, a... Um, a hiking outfitter has led guided tours there, but you know, again, those are you know ten day things in very small corners of the island, and they they come back to the same place all the time. So um, there have been little exploratory things, but I would say the number of private trips to a place like Axel Heiberg Island can probably be fit on the fingers of two hands. Yeah, you. I remember you you said something in um, Arctic Eden. There was a quote from a professor who about about Axel Heiberg who said more people pass through my office in a single day than have passed through there in all of history. Yep, yep. That was he was actually referring to Els, to a, a place on Ellesmere, but that's certainly true of uh, of both Ellesmere and you know and parts of Ellesmere and and Axel Heiberg Island. The Arctic ha- has an appeal in general, but just as the friction on the snow increases linearly as it gets colder. So the wildness of a place increases as you go north. So, you know, I I love um, Labrador, but Baffin feels wilder than Labrador and Ellesmere feels much wilder than Baffin. The very northern tip of Ellesmere and Axel Heiberg are the wildest places I've ever felt. I don't think I could feel anything that wild without going to Mars. Yeah, well, it certainly must be one of the most inaccessible places on the planet. Like, short of short of the, um, I don't know, some sub sub Antarctic islands that are just in some obscure spot in the Indian Ocean. These these places, the cruise ships that go there have to be like a higher class of cruise ship than the the normal ones that do the Northwest Passage or that do uh, um, you know other parts of the Arctic, just because the ice is still so much thicker there. So you know, people think of you know the ice is diminishing, and true enough, but it's it's not it's not smooth sailing. Do you think that's the future of, of travel in some of these regions? The this influx of cruise ships as as ice diminishes in certain areas. And oh, sure. Is that is that yep. a good thing? I mean, on the one hand, you could see it might inject money into these communities, but it seems like a disaster waiting to happen. Well, yeah, but the cruise ships are are quite responsible in uh, you know in in how they they handle things. They you know the there's not four thousand people on on an Arctic cruise ship. There's one hundred or two hundred, hmm. and so even though uh, you know you offload a hundred people on a beach, and that you know that's still a lot, but you know that beach might see that hundred people, and then then it'll be a different beach, you know, for the next fifty years. The cruise ships don't have um, don't have that much of an impact, 
and they do, as mm. you say, they in, they inject uh, the responsibly run, and they inject money into into local economy. And they also, I look on them like I I lecture on cruise uh, ships every non COVID summer. I lead hikes. And it, it it's a bit. I, I look on it as a bit of a tasting menu. It introduces people to wildlife and scenery, and you know some of the history. And so you can get a sense of what you what you most enjoy. And even people like myself who have so much experience in the north, we're always you know learning on these things because you see, the more time you spend, you you see different things. You experience. Um, just you know little faces little glimpses of sides of the arctic you haven't seen on any trip you go no matter uh, how hard or easy it is so what sort of people tend to be attracted to those to those cruises people who are intellectually interested in the arctic um hmm. you know you you can't buy gucci bags at at the uh, the tiny store there it's not you, you don't have ventriloquists on board um you know the the food is good but it is mainly for people who um, want to see a part of the world that interests them. So you know, mm. some of the, you know, largely unconventional people. Um, sometimes you will get scientists who fell in love with the Arctic early in their careers. And now that they're quite old, that's the only way they can see a place that meant so much to them. Yeah, so I, I've always really uh, admired and liked the uh, the people that I, I meet on these cruise ships, whereas I don't think I would do as well on a southern trip. Yeah, that's my idea of like a, a floating prison. That must be awful. Yeah. I've always dreaded such an idea. It's kind of heartening to to hear your take on that. That's It's not what I would have expected. One of the, the funniest um, magazine article I, I think I've ever read was David Foster Wallace's take on a southern cruise ship called a uh, a supposedly fun thing i'll never do again it's available <laughs> online and he published in harper's and it is absolutely hilarious well i think you should uh, you should push your cruise contacts to go to go full old school like and only serve traditional arctic explorer menus like they just should subsist on bully beef the entire time yeah yeah well um you you get a chance to sample traditional foods sample the the inuit foods that that uh, we can buy in the communities and that's really cool because there are some as we've discussed muktuk that are an acquired taste and there's others like caribou that are better than mm. the best beef caribou is fabulous meat God, not at all gamey yeah. yeah even even raw and frozen i've i've had it and it's it, yeah it's it's like eating sushi it's just great mm. I suppose you'd have you'd have to draw the line at lead solder and tins or whatever. Yes, you know, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. Another Franklin I, expedition. Yeah, you don't. There are some things you you don't need to experience, like losing fingers to frostbite. Or I, I always used to lo lose my fillings in the Arctic because of the constant expansion and contraction in the mouth. You know, you're you're uh, putting warm food into in, in, you know into the into your mouth, and you're breathing in cold air, and the expansion and contraction bridges and fillings would always fall out and th then as uh, dentistry has evolved uh, you know I, I think this is true with everyone but certainly my dentist began using a different sort of amalgam that had a, a more modest coefficient of expansion and so I, I stopped losing the fillings that's amazing so you're, you're like a scientific test case <laughs> well you know if you read some of those Antarctic explorers of the early 1900s they were also losing their fillings in one of the two books, you you talked about a, a photographer who got a bit too close to the muskox and got butted and, and knocked loose every filling in his head as well. <laughs> yeah, it turned him into a tuning fork, and that kind of vibrated. The, yeah, gave gave him enough of vibration to shake out his uh, his fillings. Yeah. So, have you had any other any other kind of complaints like this in in the high Arctic when traveling? Any sort of like medical mishaps that caused you alarm? Um, no, I, again, as I, I said early in the conversation, there are some things that are just the price of admission. For example, on very cold trips where it's forty below a lot, you know, you know, you I've I've gotten one very mild case of frostbite on a finger on on the first trip I did, but no frostbite. But but if the surface temperature of the skin is below a certain uh, a certain temperature for long enough, below I think about. 
9 or 10 degrees Celsius, uh, the peripheral nerves die, so your feet, your feet get numb. So on those very cold trips, I'll, I'll get kind of, you know, tingly toes, tingly feet. And that'll last two or three months after I get home until the, the nerves, which grow back about a millimeter a month, uh, kind of are, you know, there in feeling condition. But once you know what, what that is, once you know it's not, it's not permanent damage, it, it's just, a, you know, a, um, a superficial trauma, then again, the, the tingling is a small price to pay for the uh, um, the pleasure of being up there. Mm. I, I also want to mention um, the other book, Arctic Eden. We kind of touched on it a little bit mm -hmm. uh, throughout. But uh, when, when I read Horizontal Everest, I was constantly you know, going to Google Images and trying to find every every little island you mention or little place or site on a beach. I'm, I'm looking for images of these uh, things online to, to get, travel along with you in this yeah. uh, in this journey. But with Arctic Eden, you, you've given us that. It's a beautifully illustrated book. With photos, you know, few, uh, places few people have ever seen. Well, uh, you know, I've, I've always considered myself, a, a, you know, a fairly simple photographer. But the, um, the the technical difficulty with with a lot of those shots is that I had to walk 600 kilometers to get them. That was the mm -hmm. hard part of it. Then, then it's just pointing and framing, and it was fairly, you know, fairly simple photography. How, how about the cold with cameras? Well, with digi with film cameras, uh, you know, in in the early days, it was uh, it was relatively easy. Uh, digital cameras, you have to pick the right ones. A, a lot of the batteries in the certainly the small batteries in digital cameras don't work at all in the cold, and so you have to you have to buy a model that has um, the option for a, like a winder that that c can accommodate. A chunky, big, um, professional battery and that will work in the cold. How, how long would that last you then? These batteries last a long time, and uh, yeah, and and I would bring you know on a two month expedition, I I'd bring you know five to seven of them. You know, sometimes I'd bring a hundred double A batteries, double A lithium batteries for further south. You know, in the in the southern parts of the Arctic, if you need a headlamp or for for flash or for other. Uh, for other uses, GPS or whatever, I, I make sure that my my GPS is as much of my electronics as possible can run off mm -hmm. AA lithium. So how do you, how do you balance out the needs of of photography and writing? Like as I've always found that it's I, I don't do photos at all. My wife's a photographer, so I, I try to convince her to go with me to some of these places that I want to write about. But mm -hmm. um, the eye is totally different, right? Like when you're when you're writing a story, you're obviously looking at things in a different in a different sense than when you're trying to frame images so how how do you balance the two uh, when you're alone like that i took up photography on my first arctic expedition uh, because i wanted to do a magazine story on it and i knew that magazines needed photos so i took it up reluctantly because i figured it would get in the way of the experience and and it did but i got something from it seeing you know, seeing decent images and afterwards, uh, you know, images are such, images are so strong that sometimes some, uh, when you think back on a trip, you think back on the best images of the trip. Mm. Um, and s some of my first images were, were published, um, you know, uh, as good, they, they weren't great, but they were competent. And I, I worked hard enough at it to, so that I could, you know, throw away ninety percent of the images and still have a few left to illustrate the story. And then uh, I, I found that I actually had a visual side, and I continued to work at it, and uh, then made part of my living as a photographer until uh, there, there became with with the success of digital imagery, it became so easy to get good shots, and people were just throwing them out there that photos stopped uh, stopped selling and so um i kind of i kind of phased that uh, that part of things uh, of things out but i you know I, I just had a visual side and so enjoyed the photo aspect but i i totally get where you're coming from because i was afraid that it would it would impede the observation of the experience because i'd, I'd be experiencing through the viewfinder
every outdoor photographer I know is self-taught. I mean, you know, the, the, the wedding photographers and the studio photographers, you know, they go to school, they, you know, apprentices, assistants and so on. But, but uh, outdoor photographers are just high energy men and women who learn by being out there and by taking a lot of pictures. And if they have, you know, gradually have an eye, they get better. I was talking to Barnaby Rogerson of uh, Elin Books a, a few episodes ago on my podcast, and he he made a point that some of the most interesting writers about place in the 20th century were, were autodidacts. There was something about being self-taught uh, as a writer and not like really heavily educated, like a Robert Byron, for example, that that gave some something different to their work. I wonder if the same is true of photography. Like hearing you describe that made me think of that. Uh, certainly the things that I've most loved, I've, I've taught myself. Um, and, and in fact, I, uh, you know, when I went to university, I was very careful to pick a subject that I had absolutely no interest in. So university wouldn't destroy my love of the subject. So you studied science, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. I studied math actually. And so uh, I was good at it. Uh, good at it as a student, not good at it as a prominent mathematician. And, and so uh, I didn't really, I had no interest in pursuing it whatsoever. Um, so it was three years or four years of uh, exercising my brain, which hopefully made me a little bit less stupid than I w- would otherwise have been. But I, I left and uh, um, you know, then I started actually doing the things I really love to do. And uh, I, I, uh, I taught myself all that. With help from a lot of, you know, with help from a lot of people and so on. There are certain aspects of wilderness travel. You, you don't want to learn to climb 514 by trial and error, right? You know, kayak a class five river by trial and error. There, there are some technical outdoor activities where you have to, um, you have to learn properly. But Arctic travel, and I didn't know it at the time, but I mean, Arctic travel is relatively non-technical. It's walking and winter camping. And we can all walk. Mm. And winter camping is nothing but an attitude and an equipment list. Well, how did you learn to read the land and to read the, the ice, for example? In the high Arctic, every, you know, the ice is, you know, the, the ice is not like ice on lakes down south which which can be thin or you know there may be things bubbling up or whatever the ice in the high arctic is either a meter or two meters thick or it's a wide open hmm. so so there are very few places where you're dealing with thin ice i mean um the people who live in the north have to deal with thin ice because they're um, they're going early in the season and late in the season and they're using snowmobiles and, you know, snowmobiles are heavier and go so fast that you can be on bad ice before you know it. Whereas a walker has the advantage of taking forever to get somewhere. I realize that about sea ice, that you could walk right up to the edge of it and it's still thick. Yeah. You can, you can hang your toes over the edge and see the water lapping the ice and it's, you know, it's perfectly solid. Yeah. And even when the ice breaks up, uh, the cover of the horizontal Everest is my wife, then my girlfriend, jumping from ice flow to ice flow. Well, that's those flows are still almost a meter thick. So when she would jump from one piece to the other, the piece would bob a little like a floating dock, but it was very safe and very stable. So and that's open water all around in those, yeah, those sections? Yeah, it's open water. So it's not just melt water on top of the ice. Yeah, that's a great photo. No, you, you do get that ahead of time. Before the ice breaks into pieces, you get that flooding where where there is solid ice underneath your feet. But that was that shot was taken a day before the ice totally vanished. So no, that's open water between the pieces. Also, there are some places in the Arctic that uh, really actually have quite nice weather. There there are these um, handful of areas in places like Ellesmere and Devon that are polar oases where just because of of um, local meteorological conditions it can be quite mild it can be it can go up to 20 degrees and there are other places that are grungier and have cool summer weather with a lot of uh, a lot of sea fog and and breezes and there of course the ice will disappear more slowly 
that was one of the things I found astonishing about this book too. You talked about things like uh, fossil forests on on Ellesmere and Axelheiberg, and you know fossil, fossilized beavers and things like that, and also that the trees when they they didn't petrify. That's right. That they were still they're still wood. Yeah, and um, where uh, yeah, yes, they they I've been to the fo- the um, petrified forest in in Arizona and. Uh, yeah, it's very cool, but th- that there the uh, carbon has been replaced by by um, I think it's silica. I, I think it's silica, whereas the the carbon did not have a chance to uh, to be replaced in places like Axel Heiberg Island and some of the smaller for- fossil forests on uh, on Ellesmere. And so yeah, it's leaves are you can still kind of delayer uh, the little bits of wood and see fossil leaves in between the layers it, and the, the you can burn the wood uh, the researcher who discovered the fossil oh, first worked on the fossil forest on Axel Heiberg Island made a brewed a cup of tea on some fossil wood I mean the wood is it, it is everywhere it is like there's tons of it emerging from uh, um, from these badland hillsides. Is it because the island would have been further south and this came from a time? Yeah, partly. Yeah, the island, but the island wasn't that that much further south. It was maybe six, uh, at the time of the forest, the, the, you know, the Cypress and Don Redwood forest, uh, it was maybe six or 700 kilometers further south. So it's, you know, it's not south. It's not, um, you know, in a temperate zone, but the whole climate was different and the winter had a lot of, cloud cover that created a greenhouse effect so winter wasn't particularly cold um yeah and so the the climate was just generally it was moister and it so uh, it allowed those uh, allowed those things to grow and who knows whether things are going to start to grow up there in the next you know couple hundred years certainly um uh, in labrador which is you know still a northern place but further south um, there are places that, you know, when I started traveling, we're north of the tree line, and now you're getting some fairly tall bushes growing. Uh, and that's mm. just in the last 10 or 15 years. But paleo Eskimo sites as well, you mentioned, how, how common are they to come across? Oh, they're everywhere. Like every point of land would have a, uh, a site from some ancient, uh, ancient Inuit and pre-Inuit explorer who's... Uh, who's camped on, on that on a point of land and you know if if nothing is disturbed the rocks they use to weigh down their skin tents against the wind will still be there rocks don't move in in a thousand years if nothing moves them and so yeah you'll you'll see those things everywhere it's they're they're very common the only thing is that you know i i've always preferred the the um, the explorers because they had names and you could kind of understand personalities a little bit better than these um, more ancient uh, more ancient peoples you you can't uh, I, I suppose that archaeologists could get a better sense if they were excavating the place and saw little um, you know little bits of jewelry you know from from the, that time you could get more of a sense of the people but f- for somebody who is just looking at a, a a site on the surface often the sites are buried by you know gravel that's blown over and covered it and so you're not looking at a great deal and so um, there's less potential for your imagination to take flight yeah I, I suppose yeah having having read some of the diaries of these guys and and knowing the story and what took them there and where they came from it's much easier to connect with them in some some meaningful way that you could sort of imagine yourself into their position. But like I've, I've come across some um, prehistoric rock art in the central Sahara. So you see cattle and you see a lot of cows, so that's a lot of painted cows. But the only time I ever came across something where I felt like, geez, I, I can connect to these people. We were in Chad and there was a, there was a mm-hmm. panel of rock art and it, it was some sort of a festival or something. It looked like a Matisse painting. Like the people were dancing and somebody was falling over something. And you could just imagine like these guys painting this thing and say, oh, this is where Gorg got drunk, you know, and tripped over this thing and fell in the fire. Like there was such an immediate connection with, with these people 8,000 years ago. But that's the only time I've seen that the rest of the time you, 
yeah, it's it's there's a, an alienness about it that's that's difficult to bridge. Yeah, but but when you have an experience like you had, and and the the, the people eight thousand years ago come to life. I mean, there, there's really nothing like it for for understanding that today or you know in the nineteenth century or eight thousand years ago, people are people, and they they had the same dreams and desires and senses of humor. This was only two thousand years ago, but reading. The Golden Ass by Apuleius, a Roman mm. writer, and it was hilarious. I mean, yeah, it was like, wow, a two thousand year old guy is funny. Well, of course he's funny. The other, th- yeah, the other thing that really uh, amazed me too, and you said that the um, High Arctic is above the Mosquito Line. I've never heard of that before. Well, it, it, it's a an informal line, and no, but I mean, I got you. Just imagine these places as completely infested and bug ridden, and mm. and just a misery to travel in the summer. No, Ellesmere has, you know, there's a, there's a couple of places, these polar oases that I mentioned that that are warmer than, you know, you would usually find at that latitude. There are some mosquitoes and yet there's a, yet they seem to have lost the ability to bite promptly. So you'll, you'll get, you know, (laughs) a, a few dozen heckling you, but they just heckle and, you know, they, they, they can kind of be part of your horizon because you're so used to being, uh, you know, fretting when there's mosquitoes around you. But these guys rarely bite. You know, some botanists who would um, research on on parts of Ellesmere in early July when the mosquitoes are out. Well, they they just bring head nets. But f- for the most part, the, the areas are very few. But that also is changing. Um, a few years ago, um, people in Greece Fjord, Canada's northernmost community, the very southern uh, at the very southern end of Ellesmere Island, began um, noticing a few mosquitoes where they never had any before. So, hmm. you know, if, if it if it warms up enough, the mosquitoes are going to uh, start moving north. Now, f- fortunately, black flies end in southern Baffin, so there are no black flies. So, yeah, that's great. They have so little contact with humans that they don't even know enough to bite you. They don't know you're edible, maybe. They've learned to heckle, but they, they haven't learned to... Uh, they, they haven't really learned to chow down. Well, that's tremendously appealing, this this mosquito line. And then the other thing you mentioned here, you had a beautiful description of the silence, where you, you said in most places, silence is the absence of noise, but in the Arctic, silence has weight and shape. Well, sure. I, I mean, if you sit in a room that is silent and you try to consciously listen, your ears reach out and it, it's almost like they bump against the walls. Whereas in a truly silent environment like the Arctic, your re- your ears reach out for inf- to it toward infinity and don't catch anything. It's a very different feeling being in a silent mm. house and being in a in a truly silent place. I, I felt that in the desert as well, where it's so silent. You know, you can hear the blood coursing in your ears. And I would imagine that in the hot it. deserts, the only sound you'd hear is the scratching of sand grains over each other. Yeah, when it, when the wind dies down, then and that goes away, then then you don't even have that. The other uh, quote that I thought was really beautiful, uh, your description of the winter sun in Arctic Eden, you wrote that it's uh, hanging small and pale, as it might appear from the edge of our solar system. That that really captures the remoteness of the place nicely. But all, but also I, early in the season, the, the 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 sun brings light but not warmth, so it feels like the sun will probably feel on mm. neptune where it's so far away that you get this you know little ball of faint light in the sky but it re- really doesn't uh you know add any warmth so that's how that's how it feels like in uh, in march for example in the high arctic yeah you capture that really beautifully just in in such a tight sentence that that feeling of being you know an explorer on some out outer distant planet or a traveler that's that's trapped on neptune looking back you know at the at the sun in the south and the place where you came from and well, there's a lot about the Arctic that does feel alien, and in a way, uh, the Arctic appeals to those of us who, perhaps, in some ways, wanted to be astronauts and were born in the, you know, born just a little bit too late to be uh, 19th century explorers and too early to be space travelers. Would you go to Mars if you're offered a one-way ticket? Uh, sure, <laughs> I'd do it in a second too. My wife was against it totally. I said we should sign up, but. Oh, absolutely. 
a planet sized desert. I can't think of anything better than that. Yeah. Just like everything you see, you're seeing it for the first time. It's tremendously exciting. And that's what, that's what certain types of travel do to you. I mean, it kind of, they, they turn you into children again, where you're seeing the world for the first time. And the more different the place you go to is from the place you're used to, the more childlike you feel. Mm. Yeah, and it brings back that sense of wonder and alienness, and you, yeah, it really opens your eyes afresh. In terms of the people too, like a, I, I, the farthest north I ever made it was Norman Wells on a, on an outpost uh, magazine trip, but it seemed like the people, the people were always from somewhere else. Like they, they either ended up there for work and they loved it and they stayed, or they were kind of running away from something in the south and they just don't want to talk about their life before that place. Is is are the high Arctic communities similar to that or different? Well, well, there's not the same industry in the high Arctic community. So most of the people um, that live there are, you know, Inuit uh, um, who, you know, have been there for quite some time, except for, you know, a couple of the, um, a couple of the more modern communities. But, um, and, you know, you, you have the occasional people from the South, teachers, nurses, um, sometimes the managers of the local grocery store. And yeah, yeah, I guess you have to be a little bit off to uh, want to uh, want to be up north, but it's a it's a good type of off, I think. And I think yeah, so, you know, yeah. and some of the people some of the people are just putting in their time, like some of the RCMP officers. I've known a lot of them over the years. They're just putting in their time because if you volunteer for a hardship uh, posting, you get to choose where you want to go next, and that gives them a certain. Uh, yeah, a, a certain amount of mo- of preferred mobility, where whereas there are others who go there and you know to their astonishment they find they like the place for itself. I met some fantastic people in Norman Wells, the wildlife guys that were that were stationed there. They had such great stories as well, but they were this type, you know, that just fell in love with the place and stayed there for their entire career. But it, it really felt even even there it felt like another planet, like so far from the from southern Canada that it, it could be a different country. Well, when you're just starting out, how how do you know what you're going to fall in love with? You you know that's mm. that's what the twenties are for. You try things and uh, and if you're lucky, you'll um, you'll hit a bullseye. And I you know I certainly did with the uh, I certainly did with the Arctic. I, I mean I just yeah I just fell in love with it, and I had no. I didn't know anyone who did it. I had no um, no experience, but I guess I was drawn to that sort of thing strongly enough to spontaneously decide to try it. And sure enough, uh, it was the right decision. So how, how do people in those communities view the South, view, view people in Ottawa, for example? Do, do they see the South as, as an alien planet as well or as so, as so disconnected? Well, it depends. It depends where they are, and you know, people in the north um, are quite well traveled uh, now too. There was uh, there was one in, well known Inuit hunter. He's he's gone now, but uh, he he and uh, one of the local outfitters in Resolute used to uh, uh, go to Vegas every summer to play the slots, <laughs> which is quite funny. So yeah, I mean, people, you know, people have phones up there. They have, you know, increasingly, you know, cell phones. They've always had television, so it, you know, they are not that isolated. Of course, down south, the, sh- the sheer amount of people is is quite um, unnerving, as, as as you can imagine. I mean, anyone, you know, you don't have to live live in the Arctic to be, you know, rattled if you live if you come in a small town and suddenly find yourself in New York city or Toronto or somewhere like that, it's going to feel alien and going to feel, you know, too fast and very, you know, and disturbing. And you don't know what to do at, at stoplights. And there are all these rules that, you know, that you've never had to follow that suddenly, suddenly you have to learn. That's the, you know, the, the cultural disconnect. To Europe, maybe 10 years ago. So maybe things have changed, but it seems like, you know, Canadians always pride themselves on having on being a northern country, but we neglect the north, or we really don't think about it most of the time. To our shame, almost like some of the the neglect of some of the communities seems quite terrible. See, I don't think I don't think Canadians look at themselves as, as a northern country. 
co um, country. Uh, I think the Scandinavians do, the Russians do, a lot of the other uh, northern nations do. I, I think Canadians look in the mirror and see surfer dudes. Really? They they, they see they they see Florida where they spend their vacation. Mm. They 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 look south. They see themselves as belonging south rather than north. Yeah, south, but not American, right? Like that's maybe that's where the northern that's the right northern connection comes in. So that's right. But, but the surfing business that's that's new for me. Would you have said that in Montreal too, or is this is this like a you know an Alberta thing? Or? I think it's I think it's general. I, I think I think it's I think Canada is quite different when it comes to embracing um, nordicity. Mm. Canada has been called the, the horizontal Chile because 90% of the population is within 150 kilometers of the U.S. border, right? So, yeah. And yet, as I did say in the horizontal Everest, uh, Canada is only uh, less than 900 kilometers shorter from north to south than it is from east to west. It, it's a tremendously vertical country. It's astonishing. Like, I, I, I remember the first time I realized that I put my thumb, you know, at the bottom of southern Ontario. My, I stretched my, my middle finger all the way up to the tip of Ellesmere, and then you rotate, and it's, it's, you're down in South America somewhere with that distance. You've switched a lot of your tra your Well, your early travels were in Labrador, and now you've, you said you've gone back to that. Like, Yes, that's right. How does that compare to... To a place like Ellesmere, well, Labr Labrador is different. In in some ways, you know, it's much further south. L large parts of Labrador still have trees, although if you go further north, you are getting into Arctic. Arctic, sort of the difference between Arctic and subarctic is Arctic doesn't have trees, and the subarctic does. Um, in some ways, um, Labrador is rougher than Ellesmere. Ellesmere is a very gentle landscape, and Labrador. The, the weather is much worse. It's windier. It, you know, you're getting you know rain and snow and wind and sun a, a dozen times in a day. Uh, so in some ways, um, all my very hardest trips have been in mm -hmm. Labrador. It's it's very cold in the interior in winter, whereas Ellesmere, uh, there are places you can go where it's quite cold. But if you if you're on the sea, even though it's it's a frozen ocean. It, it uh, kind of has a marine environment where it's a little bit, uh, a little bit milder. Um, my, all my coldest temperatures have been in interior mm. Labrador, and uh, and my hardest trips have also uh, have also been there. So um, and the other difference is that uh, you know a significant number of people live in Labrador, and so it, it is you know it is partially a partly a cultural experience whereas in the high arctic you have um you know a, a hundred plus people living in greece fjord and a you know a handful in a weather station here and some in a military base there but uh you know i found myself communing more with ghosts whereas in labrador the human presence is part mm -hmm. of the story and i've just finished my next book which is on a literary travel book similar to the horizontal Everest on Labrador. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's it's a different it's a different experience, but in some ways, um, it, it is also a wild experience. And yeah, some of my yeah roughest trips, I've kayaked the whole mm. coast of Labrador, and that's a rough that's a rough place to travel because winds can come up out of nowhere quickly. It, there are long stretches with few places to land. Um, and there are in particularly in the northern Labrador, uh, it, it is almost untravelable now because there's like so many polar bears because of the lack of ice further north. No, no. The, the, one of the theories is that the moratorium on harp seal hunting in the 1970s with, you know, began with Bridget Bardot and, you know, all the protests, have led to millions and millions of harp seals. The harp seals are just doing tremendously well. And the pot, you know, there used to be when I first started, no one would ever see a polar bear up north. And I, I even remember a, a reverend who was stationed at one of these these small northern Labrador Inuit towns. He saw like one in five years in the 1930s. And now they're everywhere, and it's first of all, Northern Labrador is a national park, so uh, you can't carry guns. Mm. And even if you could, you, um, which you know, on 
when I was doing a story on the touring guides, we got special permission to carry a firearm for our own protection because we were the, my wife and I were the first visitors to this new national park in the touring guides. So we, the the park kind of rightly felt that they didn't want the first visitors to the park and a journalist killed by polar bears. <laughs> it would be a bad start. Yeah. <laughs> So can, that, can you carry yeah, the, a, can you carry a firearm in uh, at the, the national park? Is it Kutenir Park? Kutenir Park? No, no, you can't. Do, and do you run? Do you encounter bears within the park that far north in Elsmere? Yeah, you can. Yeah, um, much rarer, much rarer. But uh, there are places that, like the uh, Fort Conger that I spoke that I wrote about that was where the Greeley expedition was originally based mm -hmm. that used to be all multi-year ice uh, on north northeastern Ellesmere Island and so you, you would get very few polar bears because seals don't do, do very well in multi-year ice so where the seals are lacking the polar bears are lacking but now it's largely first year ice and so I you know, where I w have spent a week without a firearm at Fort Conger, I would never do that now. Hmm. So, so in Labrador, are you, um, are you tracing previous expeditions, previous trips, that sort of? Thing? Yep. So part, uh, yeah, in, in the same sense, not every, um, not every chapter of the book is like that, but not every chapter of the horizontal Everest was like that. There are some, uh, um, you know, that focus on the, you know, the aspect of travel in this wonderful place. And there are some that focus on um, mysteries and stories and trying to basically bring them to life as an educated traveler. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things I liked about it. You've layered it. You've captured these layers of stories that exist in these places. Uh, I met a, a young Inuit fellow in, in Nain, which is the northernmost town on the coast. And one of the trips, uh, he wanted to travel 600 kilometers in winter to uh, a place that, like a town in northern Quebec that he'd heard so much about. And so I decided to go with him. So we spent a month and a half together traveling. So that, that's a different experience. And it was, it was really nice. We, we, you know, we became really good friends and I'm, you know, I'm still in touch with him all the time. Oh, great. Yeah. I look forward to that. I just, I just had two more random things I wanted to ask you before I forget. Um, uh -huh. I wanted to know if you, if you could recommend me um, a favorite Arctic book or a couple of your favorite Arctic books. And also I wanted to know um, how do you train up for these, these sledging journeys? Train up. Well, you, you know, I, I, I've always been so active. I, I will train minimally for these things. Like I'll maybe ski a little bit, you know, like I'm, I'm in the Rockies where I can, I'm within 10 minutes of, of the Canmore Nordic Center, so I can go skiing at lunchtime. So I'll, I'll ski a little bit longer or I'll walk a little bit longer. But, but basically, my body remembers what it's like to sled. And so, you know, you in some in places like England where, you know, people are drawn to the north but don't really have a lot of experience, you, you get these people in Trafalgar Square pulling tires behind them to, you know, <laughs> toughen themselves yeah. up for sledding. It, it's quite droll. But, uh, I've yeah never I've never done that, um, but you know at the same time you know I'll average fifteen to twenty thousand steps a day plus thirty to forty five minutes of aerobics every day. Whether I'll be mm. swimming a mile and a half or I'll you know be skiing eleven kilometers or yesterday I went for a two kilometer or a two hour hike up a mountain. Those of us who are born restless, yeah, just stay in shape without without effort. And you're in the perfect place for it as well. Yeah, no, it, it is. It is true. Okay. And finally, what's uh, give me a couple of your favorite Arctic books. Last Places by Larry Millman is certainly one of my favorites. It's the funniest Arctic mm. book I've ever read. It's the you know it's really hilarious. Labrador. There's two or three classic books on Labrador. One is called uh, Lure of the Labrador Wild about a tragic expedition that happened in 1903. And there's a subsequent book called Great Heart that is uh, a modern retelling of that uh, of that story. And then there's a one of these minor classics, uh, True North by Elliot Merrick, also about Labrador. Mm -hmm. But there there's not that many great books mm -hmm. on the north. There there are better books on uh, on the southern on the southern polar regions. Just because so few people have gone there, or is it because the the explorers that went there just write such tedious kind of ship's log sorts of, of accounts? Yeah, yeah, that's more the case. Whereas whereas you know in uh, in the Antarctic you had 
you know, books like The Worst Journey in the World, for mm. example, which is so superb. Yeah. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I, I'll, I'll put some links to your books and, and your website, of course, in the, in the notes on my blog. Too. I am um, the editor of Explorers Web, which is an adventure website. And so I'm, I'm doing that. As, I'm doing that full time now. And so, um, you know, we put up stories a day. It's not just Arctic stuff, although, it, you know, our, it does include Arctic stuff, but it's high altitude mountaineering, it's rowing across oceans, it's long distance hiking, it's uh, sporting things like that. So that's what I'm currently involved with. Cool. Okay. I'll include that as well. Well, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll cross paths one of these days over cold beers and uh, swap some more stories. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Thanks for listening to this episode of Personal Landscapes. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes and subscribe through your favorite app. You can find links to today's podcast and more conversations on books about place at ryanbernard.com. You'll also find a donate button if you'd like to contribute to the costs of the show. All donations are greatly appreciated. <laughs>